um, we started on section 5.1. We had no homework last night. We're just kind of working on this idea that we can find the area, an approximate area underneath a curve, right? By splitting it into rectangles, we can pick a piece, okay? Now, we were picking up on this slide right here. And this part right here, please keep your mind open with it, okay? As you read this, it's like, what is that that I'm looking at right there? It, it's hard to look at, okay? I get it. I completely understand it. But believe it or not, these are easier than what they look, okay? And I think I mentioned that yesterday. Well, I don't know if it was your class or the other class. They have a lot of bark just looking at them, but there's really no bite, okay? Um, yesterday, we talked about how we were adding up each of the rectangles, right? We took the length times the width of the first rectangle, plus the length times the width of the second uh, rectangle, plus the length times the width of the third rectangle, etc. Okay, but they're calling the length the height of it, which is your y value, and they're calling the width of it how your x changes, change of x. So this formula that you see right here is the summation notation or sigma notation. This is a Greek capital S, okay? You know how yesterday we took the S and we elongated it to show you that it was a, it stood for sum, but it was an integral? Well, this is what we refer to as sigma notation. So you can take and write every single integral in sigma notation, or you can write it in integral notation. You're going to much prefer the integral notation. There's no doubt about it, okay? But you are expected to be able to write it in sigma notation. This is something that the AP kids didn't used to have to do. And they added it in a couple of years ago because they felt that it was important even in, in that level of calculus. So we have the sum. This is saying adding up all of the lengths by the widths. And so then it shows. Here's the first length and width. Here's the second length and width. Here's all the in-between ones, and here's the last one. So depending on how many rectangles you have. If you have a 1,000 rectangles, this is the first rectangle, the second rectangle, the 1,000th rectangle, and the dot, dot, dot is saying all of them that are in between. Okay, so is it easier to read now that you understand that that's just length times width? That's all that it is. Okay, so the expressions for the areas of e in equations 2, 3, and 4 can be written as follows. So this here is just saying the area as n approaches infinity of, I'm oh, sorry, the limit, as n approaches infinity of the sum of these. Isn't that what we were doing? We were finding five, then we were finding 10, then we were finding 100, then we were finding 1,000, you find a million. That limit as n approaches infinity is saying, you're starting with you know, a smaller amount because it's easier, but as you increase the number of rectangles and you add them up, it got closer to the correct answer. Okay, that's all that this is saying. And then these are the lengths by the widths. Notice each one of these are using the same basic notation. It's just that in each of the pictures that we had looked at, they called the X's different things, okay? This was like an LRAM, this was an RRAM, an LRAM, and an MRAM, okay? The, the MRAM was the very last one that we had talked about yesterday. And so you can see they're the same. It's just how they, you know, call their X's in the problem. We can also rewrite the formula in this way. This is a little easier to look at for you as well. If we were taking and adding up all of the i squares, because remember it was x squared, right? If we're adding up all of the x squareds, it's the same as n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. So if I all of a sudden knew that I had 50 rectangles, I could just plug a 50 into that, and I would have 50 times 50 plus 1 times 101 divided by 6, and that's going to give me what the area of that would be. Okay, we don't do a whole lot with this one right here. Okay, your book provides that, just showing you there are other ways of writing it. Now, to really get into it so that you can write them in sigma notation, 
this slide comes in really handy. And this is where I kind of added this in um, a few years back because the book didn't have, like they kept using all that jargon and it was really difficult for kids to understand. So, in order to write something in sigma notation, when they say use sigma notation, okay, here are the three formulas that you need to know with it. The first formula you do have in your notes already. Change of x equals b minus a over n. Remember, b minus a is like the interval from a to b. That's where the b and the a come from. This was also in the notes yesterday, but you might not have written it down. It says x equals a plus change of xi, where a is the first guy that you started with. And then the change of x is this piece right here. And then the i is however many um, number of rectangles. So it's saying i equals 1 to n for the number of rectangles. If you have one rectangle, two rectangles, three rectangles, etc. When we write something in sigma notation, the i is going to remain in the answer. You're going to see an i there. Yeah. But isn't n also in that rectangle? It is. And so this is saying from the first to the last, you know, where it's going, you know, it's, it's varying. Because if you remember when we looked at that, as it was varying, we looked at four rectangles, five rectangles, eight rectangles, ten rectangles, you know. So it, it, we have to have that where it varies. So we're saying it's varying from one cell to n right there. It says, find an expression for the area under the graph of f as a limit, but don't evaluate. Just write it, okay? So to find this expression, they're asking us to write this right here. But before I write it, I need to collect some different things. Like, first of all, what is change of x? Well, this is saying it's going from 4 to 7. So isn't A 4 and isn't 7B? Right? So what that means is my change of X, I'm going to try to leave that formula up at the top, is 7 minus 4 over N. So Sam, let me maybe restate it to be more clear on that. I is which rectangle you're on of the n rectangles that you're talking about. You know what I mean? Like your first, are you talking about the first rectangle, the second rectangle, the third, the fourth? So it's the i rectangle that you're talking about. That, maybe that's more clear. Okay. So this is 3 over n. We don't know the number of rectangles. When we go to write this in limit notation, we need the n in there. Okay. Next, I need to figure out what x is. X equals A, which is 4, plus change of X, which is 3 over N, I. So you can just go in this exact order. Now, when you go to write this right here, in order to find F of X, it's F of this X. F of X is f of 4 plus 3 over n i. It means everywhere there's an x, I have to plug that 4 plus 3 over n i in. So I have 4 plus 3 over n i squared plus the square root of 1 plus 2 times 4 plus 3 over n i. Now let's put this around that. The limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of my f of x, which is that, you should put that in parentheses or brackets. I'll tell you why in just a second. And then times your change of x, which is 3 over n. So all I did is I just filled this in with my new f of x and my change of x. This right here is how you write it. You have to be able to write it that way. 
So we'll do a couple of them and you'll see. I know this first one is ugly, but you'll see as we go how it gets easier. Now, if it's a multiple choice question, every once in a while you'll see people put this 3 over n out in front instead. So I could have the limit as n approaches infinity of 3 over n times the sum of i equals 1 to n of 4 plus 3 over n i squared plus the square root of 1 plus 2 times 4 plus 3 over n i, like so. Now, some people say, well, should I distribute this to, oh wait, I do need brackets around that too. Should I distribute that too and combine those things together? If you do, then you're burying this piece right here, this x value that you have. See how you can see it's an x when it's written like that? But if you had 1 plus 8, which was 9 plus 6 over ni, you're not going to see that x. Okay, And you have to be able to see that x right there. You're going to want to see it for when you have to write it back into integral notation. Okay. Now, I told you just a few minutes ago I would tell you why it is that you need the brackets around this right here. If you only have this written... like this. Then this summation is only talking about that up to that point. Okay? So if I am including this in it, I have to have a bracket right there, number one. Number two, this 3 over n would be distributed to each of these and if you didn't have the brackets at the end, like I had it, then this is saying this is only multiplied by this term, not that guy over there. Okay, so it is very safe to put parentheses right here so that you see you have these two pieces. Okay, yes. No, either one. It doesn't matter. Either one. Web assign will take either. I'll take either. Um, you probably see more of mine even written right here at the end because that's how the formula is. But I want you to recognize that it's okay if somebody writes it out front. Most of you probably won't put it out front, and that's okay. Okay. All right, so let's try another one. Okay. I just These are the same formulas. Find an expression for the area under the graph of f as a limit. See how it, it's telling you, write it as a limit. Sometimes it will say use summation notation, but that's also as a limit. Okay, so go in order. Change of x. Change of x is, help me, help me out here, what minus what? So in this problem it would be pi minus zero over f which is just pi over n. Okay, next I need x. x equals? Zero plus pi over n times i. So isn't that just pi over n i? Okay, so now when we go to write this, our f of x, remember, becomes f of pi over n i. I'm using this new x. So that becomes, let's see, the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum of i equals 1 to n of the square root of sine of pi over n i and then times pi over n. Do I need brackets or parentheses on this one? There's no addition or subtraction sign, right? So it's showing them both as multiplied, so I don't need them in that particular instance. Okay, Sam? 
This right here? No. I'm just trying not to lose anybody. So yeah. Yeah, you don't have to put this right here. You you just as long as you know you're plugging that X in, it's not just F of X. Yeah. Okay, was that one easier? The first one was definitely nasty, so. Okay. Now, what happens if I give it in limit notation? Can you tell me what the interval is? Can you tell me what X is? Can you go backwards? So it says, determine a region whose area is equal to the given limit. Do not evaluate the limit. So this is the limit as N approaches infinity of I equals one to N, three over N, square root of one plus 3i over n. Now, when you're going in this direction, you need to understand that we there are multiple answers that could come out, but all would result in the same area. Okay, and I'll show you graphically what I'm talking about when we get to a good one. And this will be a good one to show you once, once we get there. Okay, so first of all, we need change of x, and change of x is b minus a over n. And we know that change of x is 3 over n, right? Everybody agree with that? So that means b minus a is equal to 3. That's what we can gather from that. Is everybody okay with that? I don't, I don't have b and a, I just know it spans 3 units wide. Okay, now, next. Before we found x, now we're going to look here and we're going to determine what is our x. Now, some of you are going to say x is 1 plus 3i over n. And some of you are going to say x is 3i over n. You're all right. Whatever one you want it to be. Okay. Now, since we are used to x being a number plus something i, I think most people would choose here that this entire thing is x. 1 plus 3i over n. Now remember what this represents. This represents a plus change of x i. Isn't our change of x the 3 over n piece? So now we know that a is 1. That means we can figure out what b is. We come back up here, b minus 1 has to equal 3. So that means b is 4. Does everybody see that? Everybody okay with that? I don't want to move on if you don't see that. Okay, now, remember how this here was f of x times change of x? So f of x is this, but our x was this piece. So our original f of x would have had to have been just the square root of x. So this was plugged in for the x to give us that. And the interval was from 1 to 4. Now. Think about this. This is talking about the square root from 1 to 4. This area right here. That's what it's representing. So that limit notation is representing that piece of that graph. Okay. Had somebody said x is just 3i over n, then that means 0 plus 3i over n. It means a is 0. That would mean something minus 0 equals 3. It means b is 3. It means my f of x would be the square root of 1 plus x. That graph is a graph of that that's been moved to the left one. 
And then from zero to three, it's that area. Do you see how those two areas represent the same thing? It's just a shift is all it is. So when you get an answer up here for your X, when you choose your X, you're going to choose whatever's easiest for you to see. But sometimes people see different things. another. Determine a region whose area is equal to the given limit. Do not evaluate the limit. All right, so that I know the change of x is 3 over n, which means b minus a over n, so b minus a is equal to 3 again. I'm going to redo this from the last one. Huh? What does somebody want to call x? 2 plus 3i over n. Someone else could have just said 3i over n. Could someone have said 1 plus 3i over n? Right? Couldn't this be 1 plus 1 plus 3i over n and someone counted that part of it? Right? We don't tend to think that way, but the reason I bring that up is what if you're doing something and someone did that and you're looking at it and you've got to, you know, you've got to follow it along. Just understand people can call x different things. I would probably call my ex this exact thing. Okay, I'm kind of just being that devil's advocate to say keep your mind open. It could be different things. Okay. All right, this means A is 2, right? So what is B? 5. Good. And now can we figure out what the function is? F of x is the fourth root of x. On the interval from 2 to 5. So, determine the region. It's the region of that graph from 2 to 5. Okay. Now, I want to mention something here and on the last one. I know I have another one here, but I want to also bring up that whole integral piece. Okay. The area under this graph from 2 to 5 written in integral form we make this elongated S. We put the function under there. And right next to it, we have to include a DX. Saying it's with respect to X. Okay, my letter that I'm using here is X. And then these numbers here go from the bottom to the top, from smallest to largest, from 2 to 5. So this is the integral notation. This is the summation limit notation. And what you're actually doing is finding the area under the curve from 2 to 5. This is a Greek S. This is an elongated S. Okay. You will much prefer this here, but you have to be able to look at this and get that and look at that and get this. Okay, so I do have a worksheet, not for next week, but for the following Monday, where you're going to be doing the whole day. You're going to just be going from back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, from one to the other. So did you say the same thing? Yeah. They mean the exact same thing. The, di the difference is, this one is specifically for adding rectangles, like an infinite number of rectangles that get you super close to the exact answer. This one here evaluates it to give you the exact answer. It's not rectangles, okay? But we always start with rectangles so that you understand there might be a time that you don't know an antiderivative to solve a logarithm, in which case you could go back to the rectangles, okay? All right, so now let's go back to the others because I think it's important to be able to go in both directions here. Find an expression for the area under the graph of f as a limit. Do not evaluate the limit. So I'm going to pause the video. I'm going to give you 
a couple minutes to write it, and then we'll talk about it together. Handy. All right, so let's see how you did on it. Let's see. Um, change of x, you should have 5 over n. Get that. Then x equals um, 3 plus 5 over n i. Did you get that? Okay, then to write it, we would have the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum of i equals 1 to n of the square root of 1 plus 3 plus 5 over n i and then times 5 over n. Which, quite honestly, if you were ever checking your answer in something, someone may have taken and written it as 4 plus 5 over n i, and then times that. Right? So that kind of takes you back to what I was talking about before, that just because they have it written like this doesn't mean 4 plus 5 n over i is my x, but it certainly could be. 3 plus 5 over n could be instead 2 plus 5 over n, 0 plus 5 over n. You know, like there's an endless number of possibilities for this. Okay. How did you do? Did you good? Okay. All right. So now the distance problem. Remember, this was labeled as um, for, for this whole section, it was talking about areas and distances. And we talked about areas yesterday. But now, how does that relate to distances? So now let's consider the distance problem. Find the distance traveled by an object during a certain time period if the velocity of the object is known at all times. If the velocity remains constant, then the distance problem is easy to solve by means of the formula. Distance equals, you've heard rate times time, but they're using velocity here. But if the velocity varies, it's not so easy to find the distance traveled. Okay, so I'm sure there's a problem next coming up with that. <coughs> I have one on the top of my head I could throw out there too. Suppose the odometer on your car is broken and we want to estimate the distance driven over the 30 second time interval. We take speedometer readings every five seconds and record them in the following table. So we have your time as your x values, and we have your velocity as your y values, and that's in miles per hour. Now, there is a problem here. These are your time in seconds, and this is miles per hour. So that is going to mean we've got some stoichiometry at some point in this problem to do, because that's seconds and hours. Okay. So, I mean, I suppose you have the option of changing this to zero hours and five over 60 to change it into an hour. You know, you could do that, but you don't have to. We can do it later. In order to have the time and velocity in consistent units, let's convert the velocity readings to feet per second. Okay, so we know that there's 5,280 feet. Here, let's do this one mile per hour, there's uh, one or 60, uh -huh, let's do this, 60 minutes in one hour, so those are going to cancel, and then from there there's 60 seconds, oops, sorry, in one minute, but I need that to go on the bottom, and so those cancel, that's where the 3600 is coming. But then that we also have um, feet and, let's see, miles. So if those measurements are in um, miles right there, there's 5,280 feet in one mile. And so that's going to cancel with that. So they multiplied the tops, multiplied the bottoms, and that's where this is coming from, just to make sure you know. like. You don't have to just know that number. You could come up with that number, okay? So they took each one of these values right here, and they multiplied it by that number each time, you know, to change all of those now so that the seconds match on these. Again, you could have done it in the other order where you changed the time to hours instead, okay? Either one. 
During the first five seconds, the velocity doesn't change very much, so we can estimate the distance traveled during that time by assuming that the velocity is constant. If we take the velocity during that time interval to be the initial velocity of 25 feet per second, then we obtain the approximate distance traveled during the first five seconds. And so what they did, remember, um, distance equals rate times time or velocity times time. They took 25 times five to come out with a 125 feet. Now that was 25, let me put some labels onto that, 25 feet per second times five seconds. So you can see where you're left with feet um, for the labels. So then they continue on. In general, suppose an object with a velocity of v or f of t um, from a to b and f of t, the y value is greater than zero. So the object always moves in the positive direction, meaning it's always moving right. We take velocity readings at some different times so that the velocity is approximately constant on each subinterval. If these times are equally spaced, then the time between consecutive readings is and your change of time is b minus a over n. Let's go back to that chart though. 30 minus 0. And how many did they take? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I think it's really 6 because if you start from 0. So it gives you 5 units for each x value. Your change in your x values or your time values would be 5 in that situation. That's what that's um, and then here is them finding the area of the rectangle. Okay, it's saying the y value is the height of the rectangle, your change of t is your width of the rectangle. Now what I could do in this chart, let me see if I have it down here already so I don't have to rewrite it. I'll do it with the chart over here, it's going to be easier. What I could do right here is if I wanted to find LRAM of this, I could take the distance between the X's. Remember, LRAM uses all of these over here, but not the one on the right. Uses the left, and I could add all those together. 25 plus 31 plus 35 plus 43 plus 47 plus 45. And from that, that would give me um, what the distance is that's traveled. It's the distance, like this is the distance in the first five seconds. Those two would be the next five, the next five, and then you add them all together. Like that summation with adding them together. Yes? Isn't LRAM skipping to the right? No, LRAM includes the left one. RRAM skips. So the R counts everything to the right and skips the first. So RRAM on this one would be 5 times 31 plus 35 plus 43, plus 47, plus 45, plus 41. So the right, the R has to count everything to the right. The L counts everything to the left. Okay. Yep. Anyways, and you could come out with both of those. They're not going to be the same number, but then you would know, well, I traveled somewhere between here and here. If your odometer is broken, you're not going to truly know because you don't know how your rate has actually changed you know, in between each of those times. So you're getting an estimate anyway. But that's what this is referring to right here. You're taking the length times the width, the length times the width, the length times the width, adding them all up, and that gives you the distance. Now, the more frequently we measure the velocity, the more accurate your estimate, because that means there's going to be more rectangles that are involved. I don't know if I have um, the number on that to give you guys with that distance problem. I'm sure I could, yeah, I do. Here. This LRAM came out to 1,130 feet, and the RRAM came out to 1,210 feet. So you're narrowing it down a little bit. You know, now, if you divide that by 5,280 and change it to a mile, it would look even more accurate, you know, depending on your measurement that you're actually doing. Okay.
That, my friends, is section 5.1. Okay? Section 5.1. Now, I have down here for your homework to be number four in the book. Okay? So that's just your book work. But then there's web assignments too. You know. But for the weekend, why don't you just do number four? Okay? And then we'll okay. I might move that worksheet even earlier um, so that we have it. This one here? How far down? There, there you go. These are the same limits that you had written, I think, yesterday. All right. Can you stop it? Stop it.